You're listening to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, your home for holistic, evidence-based cognitive enhancement strategies. And now your host, Eric Levi. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, where we discuss using nootropics, biohacking, and nutrition to help you boost your cognition. My name is Eric, and if it's your first time here, then please take a moment and remember to subscribe. If you are enjoying the podcast as we go along, then please leave us a nice um, review on Apple Podcasts. And if you are someone who is new to nootropics and supplementation or biohacking, and you want to get yourself the best quality supplements and nootropics on the market today, then head on over to holisticnootropics.com, where I have a whole bunch of different product reviews and all kinds of informational content. And right there on the homepage, you can find my free supplement buying guide. This is a fully comprehensive supplement buying guide that will walk you through ingredient by ingredient on how to find the best quality quality supplements and nootropics on the market today, because as many people know, the supplement industry is a $100 billion industry and 99.9 billion of that is absolute hot garbage that is flushed right down the toilet bowl. That's because a lot of these supplement companies, they use a lot of fillers, excipients, flow agents, a lot of cheap materials to make their supplements. And so it really kind of waters down the quality of these uh, nootropics and supplements. Not to mention, sometimes they'll do these quality checkups on the supplements on the market today. And they'll find that the supplement that you're actually buying isn't actually even in the product that you got. So as you walk around Walmart or Costco, or you buy supplements on Amazon or GNC, and you see these supplements, you can look on the ingredient list and look for the different things that I put in this buying guide and avoid those because that will help you find the best quality products on the market today. Okay, let's jump into today's podcast with my guest today, Dr. William Shu. Dr. Shu is the chief medical officer at L Nutra, the leading Nutritech company developing innovations in nutrition. In his role as chief medical officer, Dr. Shu leads the clinical de- uh, development effort and oversees the medical affairs department. By advancing education, he enables patients to make a fully informed adoption of intermittent fasting and the L Nutra's fasting mimicking diet called Prolon, a five day meal program that keeps the body in a fasting mode while enabling people to enjoy nutritious plant-based foods. Before his time at El Nutra, Dr. Shu spent 20 years as an endocrinologist at Harvard's Jocelyn Diabetes Center. Among his prior roles, Dr. Shu served as the vice president at Jocelyn Diabetes Center, a teaching affiliate of Harvard Medical School, responsible for its international education and healthcare advisory programs. He served on multiple national level professional committees, including the American Diabetes Association, setting national standards of medical care and diabetes. His previous research interests focus on the pathophysiology of diabetes and the application of digital technology in chronic care. Dr. Shu, welcome to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast. Well, thank you, Eric. That was a long introduction, but uh, So long, it. right? <laughs> Why'd you have to do so much stuff before you went to El Nutra, man? <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, that journey was very helpful uh, for yeah. me in, in realizing, um, you know, nowadays when we talk about health, a lot of people actually know what to do uh, with their health. Everybody knows we got to eat better, sleep better, more exercise. But the reality is very few of us can actually do that on a daily basis. And so I kept doing El Nutra really seeking new ways we can help people that we didn't have access to before. So we can talk more about that later. Yeah. And, you know, actually, I mean, we could, we could jump into it now um, because we were, we were actually talking just before we jumped on here that like, you know, a lot of people listening to this, maybe maybe they are new to the health and wellness game. I certainly remember when I was and all of this was new and like any piece of advice was just, I mean, it was amazing. And sometimes it was like the first time I'd heard it, you know, like I remember we're still like learning about gut health. It didn't make sense to me when I first heard the the term microbiome. Like it took a couple yeah. months before I finally understood what that even meant, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And I was saying before we jumped on, like, hey, the whole thing that doctors tell patients, hey, diet and exercise, diet and exercise, you know, you need more diet and exercise. For, for most people, that, that they don't know what that means, you know? And it, I find your your past experience actually very interesting, specifically with endocrinology and diabetes, yeah. because first of all, those two things go together, and I don't know if most people know that. And second of all, w- you need to be able to master your, your endocrine system and your hormones, because that's going to directly affect 
you know, how your body stores fat in the first place, how your body metabolizes things in the first place. And it's going to affect your, um, you know, your insulin sensitivity because insulin is a hormone. So, um, I want to get into all that. I know I just kind of buried the lead a little bit, but, um, before we do like, what brought you to that specific angle of medicine? Because there's so many ways you could go. Yeah. Um, what, what, what made you interested in, in you know, endocrinology and, and uh, diabetes specifically? Yeah. So if you look at the, the amount of healthcare dollars we spend in the U.S., which is really number one in the world, right? We, we like to be number one in the world. <laughs> but this healthcare expenses has risen tremendously over the past years. And, and now if you look at the numbers, one out of every four dollars in healthcare dollars are spent in people that carries the diagnosis of diabetes. So this disease is like the mother of all diseases. You know, it, it, it's related to your eyes, it's related to your heart, it's related to your brain, your skin, your kidneys, your legs, your nerves, your sexual functions, everything. And so if there's one specialty that I, you know, I was thinking that if I could go in to that can impact not only many organ systems in the body, but also healthcare as a, as an entity, this would be one area. And so out of so I picked endocrinology and out of endocrinology, I was drawn to the field of diabetes because of its broad reaching mm -hmm. impact in the human body as well as in the healthcare system. I couldn't agree more. And from your perspective, why is diabetes such a problem? Yeah, you know, the, if you look at 100 years ago, we, we hardly heard diabetes. I mean, it was described in the textbook, but it was not an epidemic. And I think this really came about maybe about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when we saw in all around the world, the number of people who are who suffer from overnutrition surpasses the number of people who suffer from malnutrition. So it's really an environmental change. And so the economic improvement that we've seen all around the globe actually ushering an unprecedented uh, a challenge where more people now have more access to food and our environment is pushing us to become a heavier. And, and that became, that seeded the, the, the issue of, of weight gain and insulin resistance and subsequently diabetes and all of its related complications. So I, I say that diabetes is really a foodborne disease. Yeah. So do you think it, do you think it's a specific macronutrient? Do you think it's a specific ingredient that's in the diet? Do you think, I mean, there's so many different angles on it. Like, yeah. like if you had to nail it down to, and I'm asking, I know this is kind of difficult, you know, um, it's, it would be hard to say, is there one thing, but if you were like gun to the head, what is the one thing? Yeah that you would that you would put at the blame of of why this yeah. has exploded in the last 20 25 years yeah i think a lot of people have looked in, into this right so uh is there a genetic component there's certainly is uh, a certain population group certain uh, genetic makeups that do predispose individuals to development type 2 diabetes um and here by and large we're talking about you know so maybe i should start by saying that diabetes really has uh, in broad categories two different types there's type 1 uh, that has to do with the body's uh, the ability, inability to recognize self from foreign cells and, and thereby launching an autoimmune attack on the factory that makes insulin, which is the <laughs> pancreas. Let's put that aside. That's a totally different discussion. I mean, what we're talking about here is mostly it's, it's our garden variety type 2 diabetes, where it's driven by a change in our diet. And it's really, as you said earlier, the onset of the program closely linked to the epidemic of obesity. That's what we're talking about here. So if you look at, you know, why, why is diabetes rising right now? We're seeing about 1.4 million cases of new, di new diabetes every single year here in the U.S. So what is driving that? So behind that, I think uh, it has a lot to do with overnutrition in a sense that we as a population is growing bigger and heavier by the year. And also our physical activities is also decreasing over time as we are, uh, we have more access to technology that saves us from activities. For example, you know, when, when I was uh, young as a, as a kid, 
my parents used to, to say, hey, Will, go uh, and, and change the channel on the TV. Because 40, 50 years ago, I mean, they did not have these remote controls, right? So it was all uh, manual. So as a kid, I used to run up to the TV and turn. And, and guess what? That's activity. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, we did not have dishwashers. We actually have, actually have to use our hands to wash dishes. Those are all activities. So there's on one side, there's a decrease in the amount of activities. Now, remember, I'm not saying exercise. I'm saying daily physical activities. Because in, you know, in, in summary, that is really the amount of calorie burns that we, we incur every day. That is dramatically dropped with commuting, driving, and, and, and all these machines that help us to live an easier life. But on the other hand, on nutrition, certainly we live in a society where there's just simply too much. So quantity, I think, is number one. And then, uh, and then the quality of the food, the types of program, the food that we eat, I think that's really the, the secondary, uh, important, but secondary to the, the sheer amount of volume of food we eat and the density of the food that we eat. And when it comes to quality, what, what do you see as being the problem with the quality of food and, and what food are we talking about? Yeah, I think, you know, we uh, as human beings are never used to be consuming these refined carbohydrates. I think we, we, we understand that. But we are also, there's a lot of impurities in the food as well. So, you know, while I talked about over caloric consumption is the number one cause, but there are many other issues. For example, if, if, if our food includes a lot of impurities or, or additives or uh, or pollutants or pesticides, they're going to cause immune reactions to the body. Uh, so, for example, uh, cities or countries with a high rates of pollution in the air, in the food sources, in the water, is also linked to high rates of diabetes. Mm. And so we're beginning to see that diabetes is not a one-dimensional disease where you can say, oh, that's the culprit. But it's a constellation of many factors of the modern world that are chip by chip, point by point, contributing to this diabetes epidemic, first in the Western world, but now it's really a global phenomenon. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that the the pollution and the you know the pesticides because that's that's an often overlooked part of of this epidemic. Um, you know, I've had uh, I've had this woman on my podcast. Her name is Stephanie Seneff. She's a um, one of the leading researchers on glyphosate, and she was talking about how glyphosate works in the body and how it can disrupt metabolism. And it's it's sinister. It's sinister how this works. And it doesn't matter what macronutrient you. It doesn't matter if you're keto and you're avoiding carbs, or if you're a, a vegan and you're you know you're avoiding fat, or you're just healthy and you're just you know an omnivore and you're just trying to eat like the good stuff. Glyphosate touches so many parts of our food system. And when that molecule gets into your body, it wreaks havoc on, at the cellular level. It wreaks havoc, I mean, down to the protein, you know, down to yeah. the, 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 your, the ability of your proteins to fold properly and misfold uh, inappropriately. And um, of course, this will af directly affect like the ability of your beta cells in your pancreas and, you know, and then at the cells ability to actually take, allow the insulin to bind and then take in the glucose properly. Like there's so many ways that this whole thing can go wrong, but yeah. yet this is often an overlooked part of the problem. For sure. I mean, there's another area where we also overlook it is purely the, our circadian rhythm. You know, people who don't sleep well, who sleep out of sync to their biological clock, they are they actually prone to develop obesity and, and subsequently metabolic conditions. Just think about the, the purely uh, non-nutritious causes of our trouble, uh, sleep. I mean, it's such a major factor and, and it's such an upstream factor. If your sleep is not regulated well, it's not uh, taken care of, it affects almost every system in the body. Your, your mind doesn't work as well. Your muscles don't, don't you know, you're never going to compete, uh, you know, in the Olympics if you're sleep deprived, right? <laughs> or NBA finals, right? Uh, given the times we're in. So, so there are many overlooked factors for sure in, the, in, in causing or leading to this pandemic or epidemic of diabetes. And the sleep is so interesting. 
I use this device, it's called the, the Lumen device. And it's like this breath machine that you basically blow into. I blow, you can blow into it after meals. You can blow into it before, before you work out, before meals, whenever you want to see how your metabolism is working. And it measures the, the carbon dioxide in your breath. And it can tell, hey, you're burning more fat, you're burning more carbohydrates, you're uh, yeah. metabolically flexible. So I like to use this first thing in the morning. And I, I've been using it now for maybe about a year, maybe a little over a year. And, you know, I've been able to actually nail down th yeah. the stark difference of my metabolism when I get a good night's sleep versus when I don't get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. And it might not even be like the amount of time in bed because I also have the aura ring. So I know how much deep sleep I got. If my deep sleep was wrecked or if my sleep was wrecked in any way, my metabolism is thrown way off. I'm burning way more car. I'm, I'm burning sugar. I'm not burning fat. My, yeah. I'm not metabolically flexible and it's directly tied to sleep. But if I sleep well, the day before, the night before, I could have eaten, I could have drank a soda. You know, I could have eaten a lot of carbs. And the thing is this, this gadget, because it has a, an app tied to it that tries to get you to eat less carbs and more protein and fat, um, which I think is a good thing. But what I found is that it doesn't even really matter, like the amount of carbohydrates you eat, you know, granted, if you're eating like good carbohydrates, like, you know, like I eat potatoes and stuff like that, right? Um, or, or even dates or bananas, which they say are like high sugar. Even if I eat car like heavy carbs in that sense, if I get a really good night of sleep, my metabolism is awesome. If yeah. if I do if I go keto the day before, or if I fast, if my night of sleep was bad, my metabolism is is off track. So yeah. the sleep is is one of the most crucial factors for sure. Yeah, I, I think you're pointing out sort of the these these interventions like sleep that has a very upstream in effect and also very systemic effect, right? So a lot of the hacks we do or we hear uh, right now, it's all about targeting very specific diseases or targeting very specific pathways. When in fact, if you look at the how we the body is designed through however many years you believe our, our existence is, these are the very survival mechanism and they have such an impact. For example, when you sleep well, as you said, there's not a single system in the body that doesn't function better when you sleep well. And then flip that around, there's not a single organ system in the body that functions better when you don't sleep well. I mean, when you're sleep deprived, everything goes down. Your cognitive function goes down, your physical performance goes down, your, your sexual function goes down. I mean, that is what I mean by upstream, right? So we ought to be looking for what was part of a na nature's design of our body. Something along the line of exercise is, uh, I'm sorry, along the line of sleep is exercise, right? Think about the right type of exercise, the physical activity that's you know, that affects every single organ system in the body. People always think, oh, it's good for your heart. It's not only good for your heart. Did you not know that when you routinely exercise, it's actually better for your cognitive function? It's better for your mood? It's better for almost everything, it's better for your insulin sensitivity, right? It's better for your physical strength, your performance. And so again, I think science right now are beginning to, to begin to ask the question, what are the things that are built inside our body that we, we can tap into? That is not like the last a branch in 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 the in the in the uh, the uh, the mechanism of a disease is try to stop that. Like you know, I'm going to take a cholesterol medicine to stop the last conversion uh, into cholesterol, and therefore, I, for every disease, I got to take my medicine. Therefore, I have to take eight medicine to ten medicine. But rather, are these upstream and systematic and systemic uh, effects that I can I can really leverage? And this brings up the issue of area of my research right now is the whole area around nutrition. Because we eat every single day, you know, nutrition really includes not only the food we eat, but also the timing of our food. Mm -hmm. of our food. Yep. That's really a new concept because for years, for decades, Eric, we've been debating about like, what's, what's, what food should I eat? What food should I not eat? And it was not until this decade we begin, you know, the, the major scientific community begin to ask about, hey, what about the timing of our of our food? Mm -hmm. And by inference, or the uh, but by inverse of that statement, that is, when do we not eat? 
that now has an implication to our health. Okay. So this just became my favorite podcast because I've been thinking so much about this myself. I've been obsessed with timing of food. Like, I mean, I'm driving myself kind of crazy with it because my day is run by, by stopwatches, uh, you know? <laughs> so it's like, wow. and, and like timing of like, okay, I need to have eaten my last meal three hours on the dot you know, before yeah. I go to bed. Right. And I can't, I have to have my first coffee. I only drink one coffee, but I have it in the morning, but it has to be at least an hour and a half to two hours after I'm up. Right. And then I have to have my first meal 15 and a half to 16 hours after I had my last meal. So it gets a little crazy, but what I find is that this for me, and I'm not like that crazy, but like I, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but at the same time, like I'm not like I'm, I'm a little cuckoo in that way. Um, but for me, this, the timing has made it so that even if I eat something bad, right. Even if I go out or whatever, um, and I eat something and it's got a bunch of crap in it, it's got high fructose corn syrup, or if I have ice, you know, an ice cream one out, or I go out and has this like something cooked in crap oil or something, if the timing of that food is okay, if yeah. I have that early enough in the day, I'm going to be okay. But if yeah. I have even a healthy meal, even like a salad with, you know, fresh greens and like some, you know, farm fresh eggs and like even like liver, but I have that like a half hour, an hour before I go to sleep, forget it. Like the whole next day is off. So yeah, yeah th this timing thing is so interesting. Yeah. Eric, I think you are, you are a mom really, to, um, uh, you have company here uh, who pleads the same thing. So if you look at the, both 2016 and 2017 Nobel Prize uh, winners, I mean, they agree with it. So let me go into that a little bit. Let's start with the more recent one, 2017. Nobel Prize was given to scientists that discovered that, uh, you know, we have, obviously everybody knows we have a master clock in the, in the body, which is the pineal gland that's inside your brain that secretes hormones that tells the body that the sun is up, the sun is down, the melatonin, right? So, so I think the master clock is not a new news. What was new in 2017 that was awarded was the fact that, that every cell actually has an internal clock. Mm -hmm. There are genes, these clock genes, that are encoded into every single cell of the body. And so, so that means if you go to bed with a full stomach and having eaten a full meal, and what, when, when your cell clock tells you, hey, it's time to go to bed, you have a, a desynchronized clock. Your behavior and your internal clock not out of sync. Now think about it. Anything that disturbs that, that natural balance in the body, the signals that's put out by, by the, every cells in the body, it cannot be good for us, right? And so the idea that there is a clock inside every cell dictates there is, should be a rhythm for, for our activities of the day. When the sun rises, we're supposed to wake up and do work and eat and consume and hunt and gather, right? But when the sun goes down, we should turn off the lights, we should go to bed early. But look at what we've done. We have refrigeration that feeds us in the middle of the night. <laughs> we have lights. We have something called the internet that keeps us up uh, at night. And so obviously there, there's all this dyssynchrony uh, in our lives. Now let's go to the 2016 Nobel Prize was given to Professor Otsumi in, in Japan that discovered when you not eat for a period of time, and, and his studies were mostly in, in the lower form of, of animals from E cells to rodents, that there are amazing things happen. That essentially you are tapping into the survival mechanism of the body that was built in through millions and millions of survival time when most of the times there's no food out there. So the organism had to survive during those period. And, and what happened is that the body was able to take the stress from the outside of no food and turn that into a time of cellular, cellular rejuvenation. That's a time when the body says, hey, there's no food coming in. I got to take some of the older parts of the cells recycle them and burn them up as fuel because there's no food coming from outside. I got to tap inside. And the first part the cells go to are always the older parts of the cells that is less dis dispensable to the survival of the cells. But when the food finally comes, 
then the body, the cell is able to now make or regenerate new components and therefore supporting the cellular cycle. So the short end of this is that through prolonged fasting, now it's actually able to drive the cellular rejuvenation. The repeated cycles of fasting and then refeeding, fasting, refeeding, now becomes the secret to healthy longevity. 2016 Nobel Prize. So Eric, I think you're in good company there. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. I'll take that uh, to be on the same wavelength as a couple Nobel Prize winners. So when you say there is like these pathways, right? Um, as far as, okay, the cell is able to use its own energy. What are those pathways? Because I hear about the AMPK pathway. Um, yeah. and, I, and I'm not really clear on what that is exactly. Can, can you explain yeah. that a little bit? So MP kind of a pathway it is really pathway that this says is carbohydrates coming into the body. So, you know, there are only very specific nutrients that the cells recognize the nutrients. So there's either glucose, carbohydrate, right? Carbohydrate essentially gets broken down to glucose that's sensed by the AMP kinase pathway. So these are the sensors in the cells that senses, hey, is there carbohydrate coming to the body? Is there specific glucose molecules that circulate in the blood? If these, if there are these glucose or lots of glucose molecules circulating in our capillaries in our blood, then this, the MP kinase gets activated. That's how the cells say, hey, it's time to grow because there's food around. Now, so by comparison, the proteins and amino acids are activated by, by the mTOR pathways and by the, by the uh, uh, IGF-1 pathways. So these are also nutrient sensors that says, hey, are there proteins around? When there is proteins around, there's amino acids around, it's time to grow, right? And so what we do here all around the clock as Americans is we eat all around the clock. We have access to food all around. So these growth pathways are activated 24 seven. I mean, other than the times we're sleeping, but given the fact that we're sleeping even less these days because of all the, the schedule that we carry, now all our bodies is constant in a growth cycle. Now, for most of us, we think of growth cycle as something positive, right? We all, we'd like to be strong. We like to grow. We like to be, to, to always, you know, be active. But think about any car. If you leave the car running for a week without stopping, it's a tremendous wear and tear on the engine, on the car, on almost every mechanism of the car. The body is the same. The body actually needs times when it sees no nutrients. So you can stop growing and begin to rejuvenate. See, so, so you know, experiments have been done in, in, in East, for example, or in, in, in you know, single cell organisms or rodents. When you fast the organism, a couple of days of no food, instead of the cells dying, obviously you don't want to stretch over too long. So it's a fine balance there. But when you starve that organism periodically, the cells actually goes into this protection pathway because when there's no food, that means you're not going to grow. You're not going to have babies. It's not time to, 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 to go and take risky behaviors. And the cells actually become very conservative. It's looking to, to cut down these expenses and ask, what can I use as a fuel? How can I repair? How can I rejuvenate during this time? And all the energy gets put it into figuring out how do I survive the next period? And that itself is a self-cleansing process. We call this self-rejuvenation. Everybody, I mean, everybody, every cell needs periods like that uh, to go through that self-rejuvenation protective state. And that's what we've not seen over the last 20, 30 years with all the constant bombardment of eating, 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 more growth, more proteins every day is it's a lot of growth. We we wouldn't wish it on a, a, a on a car or any factories, any machines. We shouldn't wish it onto our bodies. So this is why when people talk about calories in, calories out, and they go, "Well, it's simple thermodynamics," I I, I think that's completely false. Um, first of all, if you took in all of those calories, you would be as big of a house, as big as a house, right? You know, you'd be enormous. The body doesn't work like that. It's more of a thing where when you take in certain calories at the right or wrong time of day, 
you are your body is turning on these specific signaling mechanisms that say grow or don't grow, grow yes. more, grow less. And again, going back to the time of the day, the circadian rhythm, some of those signals are more profound at different times of day, right? So like you're more insulin sensitive earlier in the day than you are later in the day. So, you know, if you eat earlier in the day, you're going to better metabolize that stuff. But if you eat, you know, an hour before you go to bed, your body isn't as insulin sensitive. And so you're not turning on those correct pathways. You're turning on the wrong pathways. And so the, the, the compound of it is actually what gets you more than just the calories themselves. Absolutely. I, I think the calorie in calorie out is, is an oversimplification of a very complicated uh, uh, body system. And, you know, I think the, the idea of a yin and yin actually makes a lot of sense. You know, if somebody uh, exercises all the time, spends, let's say, 18 hours in the gym, it cannot be good. It actually is it's too much for the body. It's really the 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 stress of exercise. And a lot of people don't a lot of people think exercise is relaxation. It's actually a stress onto the system. It's, you're stressing the muscle, you're stressing the heart. But it's really the recovery and the rest phase of the exercise that that really accomplishes the goal of the exercise. So same thing. There's time for nutrition, there's got to be time for extended fasting. So that this is how the, what the nature designed us to go through. And that's the best way to, to live a healthy and normal life. And in your opinion, because you, you've studied this so much with fasting, is there a good amount of time that you want to fast for to really effectively turn these mechanisms yeah. on? Yeah. So, so, you know, by, by definition, then we have to define it somehow, you know, I think anything that fasts less than two days, we call that intermittent fasting. And anything that that goes above two days consecutively, that's that's prolonged fasting or periodic fasting. I think it's very important for your for our listeners that they differentiate two different types of fasting. It's not only a matter of duration; their impact is completely different. Okay, let, let me explain. So, so if you look at the uh, uh, intermittent fasting. And most people, when they say intermittent fasting, they're talking about the time restricted eating, right? That's the number of hours you eat during the day. So by definition, it's also the number of hours you don't eat per day. So if someone say, well, I'm on a 16, eight uh, fasting, what does that mean? That means 16 hours of eating. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, 16 hours of not eating, but eight hours of eating. Okay. And some people say, oh, I'm on a 24 fasting. That means 20 hours of fasting and four, you, you focus, you concentrate all of your consumption of food within a four hour window. So while intermittent fasting has been now shown to be helpful for weight, for, for metabolic support, um, it's something that is different than what nature has, has uh, put in as a survival mechanism. Now, uh, let me explain. If you look at every animal, like, like a big cat, right? Like a lion, uh, it, it doesn't quite practice intermittent fasting, right? They have their own own, own um, uh, circadian rhythm. But what's really at play there is they hunt once, they eat full, and then there are a couple of days where they don't hunt because they go through fasting period until the next time, a couple of days later. So what the, what what happens during the, those periods of fasting is the body now adapts to that period of no food. And the body goes through the cellular changes during that time. That is the kind of deep cellular impact we're looking for when we fast more than two days straight. There's a mechanism that was described by the 2016 Nobel Prize winner, to Professor Otsumi, called autophagy. And, and that basically describes cellular self-eating. That autophagy, it's only activated at least a day, if not two days of, of fasting. It's not easily activating humans by the short intermittent fast. So, so let me just uh, back up a little bit. So intermittent fasting has great benefits on weight loss, metabolic support. But if we're talking about acti activating autophagy, these cellular turnover, rejuvenation, uh, that only happens with a longer period of fast. I use one example I often use. It's 
It's like a company, you know, a company that doesn't make money in a day, no revenue coming in, just like the sales do not have calories coming in for a day. Huh, big deal. Because you've got reserves. You have fats, you have other, other you, you have glycogen in the liver, right? So you can survive without doing too, too many changes in the body. But what, what if the company doesn't make money in a week? The company doesn't make money in a month. Now you got to restructure. Right, is the stress of no money coming in that forces the company to become leaner and 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 and, and meaner, right? So it restructures so it becomes more efficient. Same thing happens to every cell in the body. When you fast periodically for long periods of time, it's going to force the cells to get rid of all the fats, get rid of of all the junk, to 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 get rid of all the inefficient older parts of the cells. So now the next time when the companies start making money. Now this company is ready because it's so lean and mean, it's going to go grow faster. And, and same thing with the body. Once you fast for a couple of days, the, the cells are now more efficient. They've got, got rid of a lot of the older parts. Now when the food comes in, it's going to be able to leverage that the nutrients and grow into a stronger entity. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So because the 16-8 method is probably the most popular one out there. And I've it's actually the easiest heard- to do. It's easiest to do, right? Um, I've actually heard that the reason why sixteen eight even came about in the first place was because the guy studying it literally did not have access to his lab for more than sixteen hours a day, so he couldn't <laughs> actually see if the like what was happening to the mice or the rats, or whatever that he was studying. So that's why they said, okay, you know, sixteen hours. And this is why, like, so many of these studies to me, like. I think they're great, but I think they're kind of useless in artifact. some ways. Yeah, because yeah. it's like you have artifacts like that, and then you, you're stuck in this place. Well, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, you know? So it's like, are we actually seeing the benefits at 16? Are we seeing them at 13? Are we seeing them at 20, 25? Like, we don't even really yeah. know. So um, I think it's a continuum. You're right, Eric. Right. It's a continuum. And, and what we've learned from nature is, is, you know, 16 hours of stress onto the cells may not be enough to trigger some of these deeper changes. Because if you look at the pressure that of no food coming from the outside, it's always greater than a day. It's always a couple of days, if not more. Mm-hmm. Now, you also don't want to push this, this reasoning to fast 30 days. I mean, that cannot be good for us, right? So it's, it's that balance. And this is also the very reason why our company, Ultra came up with the fasting mimic in diet technology because it's so hard to fast. When you talk about, yes, I want that benefits, but it's hard to do it. And number number two, it may not be safe for most people to do it. And therefore the idea of how do we hack the cells? How do we hack the body? By providing enough nutrients to nourish the body, but not enough to trigger the IGF-1 sensor, the PKA sensor, the mTOR sensors. That's where modern technology now adds to uh, understanding, you know, of the biological system. So the fasting mimicking diet to me is a little confusing because I I get the idea where, um, and when I had Joseph Antoon on the podcast, who is the CEO of Elnutra, who you also work for, um, you know, he was explaining it and I'll be honest, like it doesn't, it doesn't really ring to me because I always thought that the benefit that we're talking about here so much is of fasting is yes, you don't want to trigger these, these pathways, right? You don't want to trigger the mTOR. You don't want to trigger the IGF one. And I look at it like, well, even a particle of food can trigger that stuff or a particle of like a gram of sugar, a gram of carbohydrate. So so let me explain. So let me explain, right? So everything has a threshold. Everything, every sensor, every pathway has a threshold. If you go below the threshold, you're able to be present, but not activate their sensors. So you say, well, a single molecule is supposed to activate the PKA sensor. But remember, the blood is already have sugars flowing around. A healthy individual's fasting is probably 80, 90 milligram per deciliter. Of course, there are already glucose flowing around. You see, it's not like it's, it's zero glucose when you don't eat. That's that's just not true. We will die. So if your sugar is 89 milligram per deciliter, that's a healthy non-diabetic level. And if we are able to give you a little bit of nutrients, but not triggering 
the level so much where it's going to trigger these sensors, you're fine, you see? So the idea that even additional single molecule of glucose is going to trigger that, it's, it's, probably, uh, it's probably not true because there are amino acids flowing in our blood. There are glucose levels flowing in our blood. And, and so there is a threshold effect. So yeah. we're leveraging that threshold effect. Right. Okay. So I'm glad you explained that. So do we know those specific thresholds? Yes. So that's why, you know, these studies are done uh, from, from, from rodent models in the animals to all the way to the humans. And that's why uh, our studies have been done. There are now at least uh, uh, 14 to eight, you know, about 18 trials completed, clinical trials completed uh, by El Nutra. These are also studies funded by the National Institutes of Health to look at the impact of, of what we talked about, the fasting mimicking diet on the health. So um, it, it is obviously very important area for us. It's also an area that has gone through lots of rigorous studies. And if I'm not mistaken, then the, the fasting mimicking diet actually does mimic like a fast, right? Is yes. that the idea? So, so it has many of the benefits of fasting without the burden associated with a five-day fast. Think about you and I, I don't know, Eric, maybe, maybe you are more of a hero than me, but I've never done a five-day for only fast. Um, I, I, can, I don't think I can afford it. Uh, it just interests my body. And, and so, but with the fasting meeting diet, I'm able to, to go through a five-day fast, derive the benefits of a five-day fast without actually going through a five-day uh, water-only uh, fasting regimen. Yeah, I've done a seven day and it was brutal. Wow. It was um I would wow. not recommend it. It was kind of in my like, let me see how far I can push this days. And it just after I did that, I, I really kind of turned myself off of fasting altogether. Um I mean, I was still yeah. doing I still do like intermittent fat, you know, like the, the time restricted feeding or whatever. But um I, I said this on my last podcast, which is also about intermittent fasting, which is um when I did that fast, I don't remember what day it was, maybe four, maybe five. I felt my liver. I felt my, I felt my liver. And that's like, not a thing you want to feel, you know, like it, I, like it, I could feel the tissue of it. And, and that's know? why, you know, we, we actually are not a big advocate of fasting for a long term. We're really into what we call fasting nutrition. Yeah. Because we're, we live in the 21st century. Seriously. You know, if you go out there, if you say let's fast for five days, everybody, I mean, you're like, you're outcast. I mean, no one would do it. And it probably is not, it's not safe for many of our listeners to do. And hence the idea, right? Hence the idea, can we hack the body by providing nutrients below the defect detection threshold of nutrient sensors? Cause so we could still tap into what nature has inspired us to do is these fasting period that we can leverage to, to enhance our health at the same time, reducing the burden associated with the water only fast. This is a 20 year old, a 20 year endeavor uh, through, through our National Institute's Health uh, a sponsor funded research activities. It didn't come easy. Yeah, I, I wonder in any of the research that you've seen, I, I heard another podcast where these guys were talking about this. They're very anti intermittent fasting, um, or at least time restricted feeding. And they made a point I've actually never heard anybody make, which is they never take into consideration prosprandial like glucose exposure, right? So, like, if you eat something like me, I was telling you, like, I'm a little crazy with this stuff where I go, okay, I'm going to eat. And then as soon as I finish my last bite, the timer starts, right? And then I'm going for 16 hours. But that doesn't mean my body isn't metabolizing glucose. Actually, my body's metabolizing a lot of glucose throughout, you know, some of those hours. And then, and then, yeah, then I'm truly fasting at some point. So I don't know if you've seen anything as far as like anybody taking that factor into account. Well, you know, the, the debate is, you know, is there more to intermittent fasting than simply a calorie restriction during a shorter period of time of consumption? consumption? In other words, if you're only eating eight hours a day, mathematically, you're just going to be eating less food during that period of time. You're just going to be simply, you know, uh, you just don't have as many time. Let's say, you know, normally maybe people eat all around the clock, there would be 16 hours. And so there, therefore you're going to be consuming more food by restricting only eight hours. You're probably not eating as much. You just don't have as much time. And therefore, even the amount of food you're eating has high glucose 
the, the totality of the burden on the body is probably less. So mm-hmm. there are now uh, an article to suggest that uh, calories is probably a big part in this. Uh, although uh, I do believe there is something beautiful about intermittent fasting, but I think there's something even more about activating the cellular responses that's only possible with a prolonged fasting. Right. Okay. I feel like we've, I feel like we've covered this, this, uh, this pretty well Um, because I have more questions, but I feel like at this point now it's up to the listener to go on to Google and YouTube and start kind of like Googling things that we've talked about because there's, there's, there's so many other ways like I, I would love to know actually before before I jump off this because I do have a few things I want to ask you that aren't directly intermittent fasting related. But um, in discussing like these pathways that pop up, like the IGF one, um, you know, and then autophagy, what I understand is that you have to suppress IGF one, and only then can you activate autophagy. Like autophagy cannot function if IGF one or maybe even mTOR is raised. Is that, is that kind of the way it works or is, yeah, is that? I mean, IGF, IGF-1 is really a global marker for your nutritional status, right? So it's hard to see autophagy happening when you have external and abundance of external energy or of resources and nutrients around, right? So autophagy often happens when, when cells are stressed with no food and that's often reflected through a low IGF-1. So I, I think your statement is true. Like in our study, for example, after five days of fasting, they begin diet, would they see a, a, a big drop in the IGF-1 level, signifying that, hey, it's a true fast. The body sees that there's no nutrients around mm-hmm. and that's the environment to trigger autophagy to happen. Autophagy is not gonna happen when there's a lot of nutrients around because the cells will be busy growing rather than cell, cell triggering cellular rejuvenation. Got you. Insulin growth factor. Okay. That's the big key. So where does longevity pop into all of this? Because this is this is like the crux of the whole yeah. thing, right? Like we're talking about this is hey, beautiful. we want to live longer, we want to live healthier. Um, you know, I, I like I like the term like add more life to your years and add more years to your life. But if you can add more years to your life with life to your years, um, where does the longevity component really yeah. jump in here? So, so the story really came about from a lot of the, the laboratory animal studies. So, for example, if you take a, a litter of rodents and you fast these rodents periodically, you know, for a couple of days, three, four days, and then, you know, you repeat a cycle every month or so. Guess what? They actually live longer. They actually live 30% longer, 30 to, to 60% longer. And that's the amazing thing is, and, and when you look at the mechanism, how could we reduce food and cause the organism to live longer? That's because when you're fasting the cell, the cell goes, goes into that cellular rejuvenation state, as I described earlier, the autophagy. So you're getting rid of a lot of these older cellular parts. And so when you feed after the fasting period, now the cells take the nutrients and build new components. And guess what? They're newer now. So you're constantly renewing. And it's not surprising when you look at, for example, you get a cut in the skin. How did it heal by itself? You don't have to apply medicine. There is rejuvenation uh, a mechanism inside every cell. So that's what we do, right? So when we go through uh, a fasting period, the body actually triggers these cellular, cellular rejuvenation states. And, and they're replacing older parts of the cells with newer parts of the cell. And cumulatively, when that happens through every cells in the body, because fasting affects every cell in the body, right? From the brain to the eyes, to the, to the skin, to the heart, then that's the potential where it can enhance healthy aging over time. And, and so this is the great mystery here, right? How does, when the environment gives us a, a stress, a pressure, how do the organism turn that stress around into a survival mechanism? And so when we fast, we actually tap into these age-old mechanism of survival. It's, it's a miracle of life. Without the mechanism of how we deal with, with starvation or fasting period in the old days, we would never have survived on Earth. We're tapping to, coming back to the beginning of, of, of our podcast, we talked about these very upstream very systemic effect of sleep, of exercise, of everyday nutrition. 
Fasting turns out to be one of those deep-seated survival mechanisms that's embedded from yeast to worms to rodents to mammals and potentially to humans as well. So we're not borrowing a page book for of 21st century medicine. We're tapping into what was part of our genetic makeup and our survival mechanism, the cells, all the way from the beginning, the origin of life. And, and how does fasting then affect your hormones? So you're an endocrinologist, you understand um, hormones, and I'm not talking about insulin, I'm talking like sex hormones, um, estrogen, testosterone, because um, you know we're talking about, hey, you're in a mode of reproduction, you know, anti or pro reproduction. So if the body's saying I'm fasting, I don't have the nutrients, I'm not reproducing, I'm shedding weight, I'm shedding old cells, but are yeah. you still making those sex hormones? So, so re, just remember, it's, it's very important to remember, we are not an advocate of fasting and fasting alone. It's always mm-hmm. the fasting plus the refeeding. Right. Right. So it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, a stre- it's like the, it's like exercise. You stress the muscle and you rest and give it nutrients. That's how the muscles gets bigger. So this whole conversation around hormone has to do with your stressing the cells that produces hormone. So it's going to go through cellular rejuvenation. So it becomes a younger version of cell. So when you refeed, the cells become younger. And that is the mechanism in every hormonal organ system of the body, from the brain to the thyroid to the pancreas. At least that's the proposed mechanism of how fasting can support the hormonal system. Okay. Interesting. So it's almost, so basically what you're saying is in terms of your hormones, your sex, like for a guy who's like, I want to get my testosterone up and they say, well, can fasting help with that? Your argument is that it's basically like you're taking your body to the gym, which if you want to get your testosterone up, you're going to have to do anyways. Test, uh, fasting is a way to basically nutritionally take your body to the gym. And then when you refeed your body saying, well, I'm not that old dirty, crusty body, you know, before I did the fast. Now I'm a new body. Now I know how to properly use those nutrients and get them to the places they got to go to help build testosterone that's right. so, and sex drive. That's right. So every cell in the body, once they go through these periodic fasting period, they become a younger version of themselves. And that's a, a, a you're addressing the cause of all these issues that we have, right? Fundamentally by, 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 giving the chance, the cell a chance to rejuvenate itself. And that process takes care, it takes place in many of the cells of our body. Are there foods or supplements, is like actually what I'm really interested in, supplements or nutrients that can help your fasting be more efficient? Well, you know, uh, if you look at our, our the, the history of nature over time, and for however long you believe, 100 million, 200, 500 million, I mean, there was never, uh, in the design of it, if you will, it's independent of anything from the outside. It's something that's embedded in every cell, right? So now, could there be any supplements that can hate, aid in this process? I think it's a matter of further exploration. And, and for us right now, inside our prolonged kit, our fast and lifting diet, we do put uh, a set of uh, vitamins in there. We did put alga oil in there to help to support the body through that period of time, thinking that five days is a long time without nutrients. And, and therefore, part of the fasting uh, uh, nutrition package that we put in this five-day fasting does have these supplements and nutrients in there. But I would say, Uh, Is that all there is that could help? I think it's a subject that requires more research and investigation. Are you aware of any research into um, like red light therapy or light therapy aiding in a, um, in a fasting mimicking or fasting protocol being that this could positively affect the, you know, the function of your mitochondria. Um, And then of course, like this is what's, you know, producing ATP and, and all these different things. Interesting hypothesis. I I do not have insight into this. Okay. I uh, just was wondering, you know, uh, thinking like, you know, cause, cause biohackers are always looking to stack things, right? Always looking to yeah, stack supplements and stuff. You know, it's not enough. Like I said, it's not enough to just say food and lifestyle, diet and lifestyle. Like we always got to have like that next level of like yes. red light, vibration therapy, cold plunge. What What is the thing that helps boost that? You know? 
So, I understand. That- yeah. Well, Dr. Shu, this was this was a blast. I really enjoyed this conversation. You really uh, were able to answer a lot of my questions, my geeky questions. And I know people listening to this, especially the hardcore nootropic geeks, uh, probably loved it. Um, and fasting is something that we're all exploring and would love to know more about. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if there's anywhere that people could learn more about you, follow you, ask you questions, um, you know, learn more about uh, El Nutra and your different suite of products, where would somebody go do that? Yeah. So if you're interested to find, to learn more about the company that's behind all this research, um, you could go to uh, l-nutra, that's T, that's N-U-T-R-A.com, l-nutra.com. Uh, for products, if you're interested in our fast and the baking pro, uh, the, the products, uh, please go to um, prolonfmd.com, prolon, P-R-O-L-O-N, F-M-D.com. Awesome. I'll be sure to put all of that in our show notes and make sure everybody knows where to go find all of that. Dr. Shu, thank you again so much for joining us today. Listener and viewer, be sure to check out Dr. Shu, El Nutra, and ProlonFMD.com. And for more all things holistic nootropics, head on over to holisticnootropics.com or take some time and peruse yourself on through the old podcast library here on YouTube or in your favorite podcast player. Until next time, everybody, take care of each other. We'll see you on the next one. Peace. Thanks for listening. For more brain boosting info, in depth articles, and show notes, check out holisticnootropics.com.